Hello and welcome back to the Apprentice One to One podcast. It is me again, and I shared a solo podcast last week from people asking questions about getting into industry. It's that time of year, so I thought it made sense to get a bit of content out around that. But I'm back with Richard and Craig again, so we can do a proper podcast tonight. Start with you, Richard. How are you? Very well, thanks. Enjoying the uh, the sunshine finally. Um, been flat pack furniture in all week. Um, busy at work, always lots going on. Um, <laughs> after the old CEF live, really enjoyed that. It was great to see you finally. Um, and uh, yeah, busy, busy, mate. Thank you very much. Busy, busy. Yeah, all good. Good stuff. Um, rather you than me with a flat pack. And yourself, Craig? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. It's a uh... Busy. I think work's never been busier. Personal life's never been busier. It's a it's a mad old time. We had a nice holiday last week, but now we're in the midst of looking to move house and move further north. Not even just like down the road. We're going up to the Midlands area to sort of see if apparently the people are nicer up there. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> You're moving close to Jamie, so that can't possibly be true. <laughs> so Jamie was supposed to be joining us tonight but he's busy working so of course we're going to mug him off a little bit and congratulations on your your holiday last week Craig that was good news for you guys and moving up further north back towards the homeland a small step at the time you'll end up back in Scotland maybe before you reach your 50s you never know nah. <laughs> no I've been sold been sold now I can earn money down here and I don't want to go on the door up there so I just have to stay where I can keep the pennies you're you're right about the the business aspect of things. Actually, we're doing some crazy things at the minute. There's loads of inquiries coming in. I've never known it to be quite this busy. I popped post out on Twitter because I'd I've noticed a few contractors saying they were struggling. I wondered what the general vibe out there was, but the feedback was actually you know everyone seems to be doing pretty well, which is is good to know, especially with the way the world is at the minute. Interest rates going up again. Yeah, yeah I had a. I don't know much about that world because I kind of don't pay attention to the news, but I had a call with a mutual friend of all of ours on Monday morning and interest rates and pensions were definitely at the top of his list as to what was in his mind at this point this week. So it was uh, interesting to see how it's going to impact everybody, I think, and all we can hope is just keep being busy. And we're employing a new QS this month. We've got that busy. We've got another full-time QS coming on, so... That'll be nice and interesting to see what that does for the business again as well. And I assume as part of that role, you'll be looking for someone who's maybe got a bit of knowledge around design, which is what we're going to speak about a bit tonight. So that's all about trying to upskill yourself a little bit, I would say, towards the um, roles at the top of the career path, if you like, and having a bit of knowledge around design is a good place to position yourself And we've got two absolute experts on this with me in Richard and Craig. Craig's just gone through his design course, so he's literally got no excuse. He should know that inside out and back to front. And uh, Richard's been doing this for a long, 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 long time. So who's going to start us off on this one? And we'll delve right into it. Yeah, you've got got uh, an idea of a fixed load, haven't you, Craig? Start off with some... Yeah. So the point of tonight, we're not trying to teach anybody how to do design. We're not trying to teach you everything you need to know. The idea was, from I think Richard, the last time we all done a podcast was to start looking at little bits and pieces of the level two and three course and how this starts to match up. So I've picked a situation which will be overspecced. It's probably overdone but there's reasons behind our choices and they start right from sort of level two if you're a full-time student all the way through to sort of your first and second year if you're a level three student and they'll gradually get more and more complex over the course of however many of these we decide to do to try and help because even at level two or your first year of your apprenticeship you tend to have a unit which on the full-time course is a two or three technology unit. And that involves you using the on-site guide. And in the early part of your apprenticeship, your on-site guide is effectively your mini version of your eggs that needs to guide you through the majority of your courses. And some of your exams, you even take it in as a use to use. So I decided to go with 10 downlights that you're going to install for a customer. It would be using flat, PVC, PVC, twin PPC cable. And it would be 
in the ceiling, but with no insulation, sort of just clip through your joists. And the reason we've chosen these is because all of this information is sort of found in the... Oh, are we lost, Craig? Gone quiet, Craig. I think your internet's lagging a bit, Craig, at the minute, so we can't currently hear you. So um, I think he was saying that he's got 10 down lights then. Did he tell us what rating they were? Was it 100 watts each? Yeah. We were going to are, are you back now, Craig? I hope so. Am I there? <laughs> so we got as far as 10 down lights, Craig. Were they 100 watts each? 100 watts each. And the only reason we've picked that is yeah. because we want to look at Appendix A and the on-site guide for people doing design where they don't necessarily know the wattage of the fittings that's been spec'd. Okay, great. Um, so we'll look at maximum demand and appendix A. Okay. And then we said it was going to be twin and CPC cable. Yeah. We'll put it over 20 meters as a run. Yeah. And it will be within the ceiling void without any insulation. Okay, so clip direct. Yeah. So that's a, a pretty common scenario of a ground floor set of lights going into someone's home from the sounds of it. Is that reading between the lines is that roughly what we're talking about yeah i mean for me i'm just basing it on say a generic kitchen for example or somebody's living room just trying to give an understanding of when you walk up to the customer's house why you choose the amount of fit and you're choosing why you're putting it on the cable you've got why you're putting it on the circuit you've got because often we just hear well actually just put it on one five or just put it on one mil, but there might be reasons and times, especially as we go through other scenarios in coming weeks where some of those rule of thumbs don't necessarily comply with what we maybe say we can just do as a standard forum, for example. So start on lights, which should be nice and easy, and then work the complexity of the process up over the coming weeks. But every one we do, we will try and base on a generic scenario. So I would say, if you have a scenario you would want us to cover, send it through to either comments or DMs to Mark, and then we can pick up from there and do ones that you may have visited or seen or want to understand why something was done when you were out in the trade. Perfect. I like it. So where are we going to start with designing of this circuit? Then what is step one? How would you approach this? So, so for me, go on, Richard. Well, yeah, I was just going to say, obviously, as, as uh, Craig has said, you, you need to be fairly familiar and have a decent working knowledge of uh, the on-site guide and certainly the regs, but more so the on-site guide. So I think we're, we're going to be looking at in Appendix A, um, which you'll find uh, on one, page 135. That looks at maximum demand diversity. Um, and then we're also going to be looking at Appendix F, uh, which is on page 167. So in the on-site guide, of course, as Craig said, it's a, it's a simplified version of some of the more important appendices or parts of the regs, basically. Um, and that's why it's called an on-site guide, not something you leave at home, you can keep it in your van. I always used to have mine with me, and I'm sure Mark does still to this day. It's a good reference book, uh, and it breaks down the requirements of the regs in simpler terms, I would suggest. Although myself, I prefer the regs only because... <laughs> I've been using the regs for, it's the first time I've got the on-site guide out for probably two or three years, but um, it's just what you're used to in it. But I forgot actually how good the on-site guide is. It is good and it does simplify things out. So Appendix A, I think is where we're going to start. Um, and these 100 watt lights, so they're just like purely resistive type fittings, Craig, like tungsten fittings. Yeah, just standard down lights that you'd pick up off the shelf from screw fix or anywhere and Obviously, the reason we're starting it this way is once you've got them specified and you know what you're going to buy, then obviously you can adapt your calculations to suit. But if you're purely walking into a customer's house and you don't know what you're going to fit, then this is your base point to be given worst case scenario, I guess, to set yourself up. Because this would be quote an intending stage because I think lots of people forget yeah. the design and the cost of your cable and everything is going to be part of your quote and your tender. So just giving you that ballpark figure and thoughts, I guess. Okay. So I take it we're going to be going into Appendix A then, yeah? 
Yeah, so I would be going to Appendix A and I will be starting to look at page 136 for yep. individuals and looking at table A1. Okay. And halfway down table A1, you have a note that tells you under current demand to be assumed that if you don't know the current demand, then you should put 100 watts per lamp holder within your installation. So that's why we've chose 100 watts. That's why we're starting here, is to say you don't know what you're spe specifying. Yep. Go with go with what the guide gives you. And just before we do the actual calculation, I think it's important to note for people yep. that when you're going through the on-site guide, the little blue numbers in the on-site guide actually relate to the regulation numbers in the regs themselves. So when you're using this, if you are on site, sometimes it's a quicker place to find something to then flick back to the actual version of the regs to be able to get the more detail held behind it. I find people or students don't tend to know that too much. So what you're saying is in the margins, any of the pages in the on-site guide, any numbers or um, uh, other points of reference in blue, that refers directly to BS 7671, yeah? It does, yeah. Yeah, okay. It's good. You're quite right. People don't realise that. No, they don't. So, I echo again what you two have both said about the on-site guide. It is a cracking little book, is that, especially when you're coming into your, your training and referencing that, the 100-watt yeah. start point. Yeah. It's a good place to begin, isn't it? Because it's going to give us a, a worst-case scenario, you would think, in terms of LED downlights. So we're, <laughs> we're on the right path to start with in specifying the circuit. And based on that, with tables and things like that within the regs or within the on-site guide, you've got to watch out for where it says C note two or C note seven or C note four, because sometimes or most of the time, the regs will send you front to back and all over the place, but it will also reference maybe some notes that are relevant or maybe relevant under the table. So within table A1, is there any notes we might need to be uh, careful of there, Craig, in terms of these lights? It tells you to see note two if it's talking about discharge lighting and other factors, but I'm not sure that's going to have too much of an impact on the circuit that we're looking to use tonight. So okay. we don't necessarily need to use the power factor adjustments or the lagging that's used under that note. And by discharge lighting, what do they mean by that? A lot of the time a discharge lighting would have been like the old fluorescent lighting that we had in the tubes and things yeah. had to heat up and cool down, whereas LEDs work on a slightly different manner and they don't take as much of an impact in startup current use to feature as a bit of a problem if you were maybe in a larger commercial building with lots of these lights coming on at the same time. So it was always a factor to allow you to adjust for that within your circuit design to ensure that you didn't trip your circuit so every sodium, time you turned your lights sodium on, light, the sodium vapour lights, the yellow type lights, and the old mercury vapour and metal halides, things like that. Well, the, the EU were helping yeah. us out with that one by banning everything apart from LED lighting, so <laughs> yeah. eventually we'll have nothing else left. <laughs> yeah, so that, that again, that note might be important, if you know, especially if you were still um, you know, specifying or installing those types of discharge lighting, you would have to consider that, because that would have an effect then on the... Um, the design current with Nick Craig? Yeah, it would definitely affect your design current and make you, and the bigger the design current ends up being, the larger your cable has to be, the larger your protective device, and therefore your higher your cost that you are working and going through, really. So it's just an important element to note for people, as you say, to pay attention to it. Um, and then when you look at table A2, we're not at that point of the situation, and we maybe won't look at the diversity in here at all tonight, even, but Table A2 starts to give you some suggested diversity factors, and it's important for people to know they are suggested because there are other guides out there, there's other references. There's not a hard and fast rule that this table is what you have to diversify as a load. That's based on your engineering judgment and your installation that you are installing. So really, that'd be down to the, it's the responsibility of the designer, really, isn't it? It's the designer's, you know, choice as to what diversity if any applies as long as you can justify it i suppose yeah and it's that justification element isn't it this is your design this is what you're putting through and you have to make that understanding so i think when we're looking at our lights now we obviously need to get a current to work from and 
if people were to look at page 167 in Appendix F, it has in there the formula about the fact that your design current must be smaller than your protective device, and therefore, with correction factors applied, the protective device must then be equal to or less than your cable size. So at all points, your cable needs to be able to handle the most current within your circuit, and the more correction factor applied, the more impact that's going to have on the cable. So sometimes it's about thinking a little bit outside the box rather than just what looks like the quickest route because actually there could be other implications to you through that journey. Yeah, okay, great. So the, the first stage of the, the, the cable cult for this then is to, is to work out the design current, isn't it? It is, yeah. And when you're at this point, you're looking and you've got it's Ohm's law effectively again, isn't it? Current is equal to your power divided by your voltage. So if you've got 10 um, fittings and they're at 100 watts each, then you've got 1,000 watts. And when people get confused about voltage, I often try and sort of send them to Appendix 2 in the regs where it says that nominal voltage in the UK is to be 230 volts. So... We know there's fluctuations, there's up and downs, but when you're doing your calculations and you're going through college for whatever form you're using, your apprenticeship, then 230 volts is the factor that you are using in that installation. Yeah, That's so, the story and we're sticking to it. We fooled the EU with that one by pretending we dropped from 240. We didn't change nothing. We're still at 240, aren't we, generally? <laughs> 250 up in East Yorkshire because they like to make sure we pay more for our electricity. But yeah, that's another story. Carry on. <laughs> so then, well, they give you, yeah, go on. So we're going to divide our um, total power then, 1000 watts by 230 volts, and that will give us 4.34 amps. Um, and it is does. Is that correct? Yes. So that gives us our design current now, which for anyone trying to learn the letters, that's now IB as far as the design goes. So your design current is your IB value. So we now need to have a protective device which is either equal to or more than that 4.34 amps. So I tend to, depends how far you are in your training and how much experience you've got. If you're not very sure on breaker sizes, then I tend to send people to Appendix B of the on-site guide to look at the tables in there which then I know they're the ZS tables, but they do have the sizes of common breakers and fuses listed within them. So you can then look under Appendix B and you would see that your next logical breaker, if so you were we, to go to... Yeah, so if we, we're going to call it, um, we're going to say it's on a 608 BSEN 608 circuit breaker, yeah? Yes. Yeah. So, so we're looking at table B6. B6. Yeah. Page 145. Yeah. And... We've spoke about it being just a normal sort of resistive downlight and loads. So we're probably going to go on a type B yep. circuit breaker. So we go down. And as you come along, yep, and go you see your sizes along. Along the top, yeah. And you, yeah, you see your common circuit breaker size have been a 3 amp, a 5 amp, or a 6 amp. So we could go on a 5. I would suggest they're not overly commonly manufactured. So a 6 amp is probably your nearest manufactured breaker that we would put our circuit on, I would suggest. Okay. So we're going to choose our protected device being a 6 amp type B6098 circuit breaker. Yeah. Yeah. And we know it's right because it's got to be equal to or more than greater than 4.34 amps, which it is. Would would you? I mean, yeah. in in general terms, with LED lighting, it's it's less likely to be a problem. But in this particular scenario, if they were a hundred watts each, would you be worried about inrush currents if they were switched on one bank, for example? Absolutely, you you'd be... have to consult the manufacturer because it depends if they're leading or lagging edge, doesn't it? And all sorts, there's all sorts of um, considerations when you. It depends on the drivers, doesn't it, as well? And some manufacturers will specify. It's got to be on a type C to allow for that inrush current, but you can only have so many per circuit. It just depends, I think. Yeah, we had some. I uh, reason I asked the question, we had some we went out to that someone else had installed. They had like 20 LED downlights, was the maximum that manufacturer would allow. Yeah. And they'd sat it on a B6, but the inrush current was cool. was quite large and it was taking it out. So obviously, if you're switching all these as one bank, that's a, a challenge in itself, I would say, from a user's point of view. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, if you're splitting it up in separate switching banks, you know, it's less of a likelihood that they're all going to come on at the same time. But certainly something to consider, especially when you've got 100 watt down lights going in a kitchen. <laughs> it's going to be bright. <laughs> yeah, okay. I would suggest that by the time it comes to this actual installation, what the effect wouldn't be 100 watts in the end. So yeah. <laughs> but I think 4.34 4 amps is quite a high lighting ampage in this day and age for light and circuits but yeah definitely it's it's a factor to think isn't it and people often try and stand by or be as domestic see as commercial as a sort of general rule of thumb but it's as you say can have its consequences if for sure need to put some more uh, money in your, in your meter uh, Craig you, 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 you sound like a bit of a Dalek <laughs> on some of it <laughs> let, me, let me try another one. It's all right. So in while we're sorry. speaking while we're speaking about breaker types, then yeah. when we're talking about B, C, and D types, yeah. for those who who don't have or haven't covered that as yet, kind of a, a B type is going to trip a little bit more quickly uh, than a C type and a D type, based on the amount of current that's flowing for a short duration. Is that the rough analogy of it? Yeah, it's it's. It's all to do with um, the thermal magnetic part of the device, isn't it? And while we're looking at the on-site guide, if you look at table 7.2.7, uh, indent two on page 90, it's got an absolutely fantastic um, table looking at the application of circuit breakers and it's got circuit breaker type B, type C and type D. And it tells us how much current you need in effect to trip the device but also what the application is for each type of device. So type B, type C, and type D. You'll find that on page 90 in the on-site guide. Fantastic, that is. And it kind of explains a little bit about, you know, application of and what we use type B, C, and D for. Fantastic. We work, we work jump down that rabbit hole now. I've diverted yeah. the conversation. Let's carry on. <laughs> Another time, we can, we can come back and have a bit of a look at that. And also look within appendix three then of, of the regs and have a look at your time current graphs if you really want to go down a hole. But it kind of makes sense when, when you know you look at that because you wouldn't want you know a small motor or something like that the device tripping as it's trying to start up because it's bad design isn't it you know you might need to allow for the fact it's going to use a bit more current to start with and then as it gets started the current settles down you don't want the device keep tripping every five minutes so that's yeah, another, in effect a common one with lighting actually that we found recently is those quartz heaters so they are kind of lights but but heaters they have a big inrush as well and a lot of the manufacturers are now starting to spec D types on those, which is frustrating when you're kind of trying to work with ZS at the end of line in someone's garden. It's not always that easy jumping onto a D type breaker. But anyway, we're going down a different hole there. Let's get back on on topic. Where are we up to with this one? We've got design current. We sorted that out 4.34 amps. We've selected our protective device and we've gone for a six amp type B, um, BSEN 6089 amps. What's next, then, Craig? Well, next we need to be starting to think about a cable and we haven't put any correction factors into this one tonight, really. So it kind of makes it relatively straightforward with the fact that you are going off and looking at table F6 and appendix F and looking at your current carrying capacity and your volt drop elements for that circuit, which um, we stipulated at the start was for a flat twin and CPC conductor on the table F6 and that it was clipped direct. So as you start to come down the reference method C for clipped, you will see that a one mil cable will carry 16 amps of current, which is more than our 4.34 amps um, design current, which is also more than our six amps on our protective device breaker. So therefore it would insinuate at this point that a one mil cable is fine for this circuit to be installed for the lighting. Okay, so table F6 on page 177, and there's quite a few tables in here, and this is based on table 4D5 of the regs book. You can see that in blue. And there's a lot of these tables. You've got to make sure you've got the right table. And as Craig said, when you look at the top, it's for a 70 degree thermoplastic PVC insulated in sheath flat cable with a protective conductor. So in sparky language, it's a flat twin and skin cable, flat twin and CPC cable. The next thing you've got to think or get the information for is how the cable's been installed. And Craig said from the start, nice and simple, it's just going to be clip direct. And when you look across the top, it's reference method C. 
clip direct and then we're looking for something above uh, six amps and as Craig quite rightly says one mil is the smallest size cross-section error they're doing twin and CPC cable but that will take 16 amps all day long so one mil cable would be more than sufficient for this circuit yeah and at that point you're you're kind of set on your journey and you really you've got your design coming you know what yep. you're installing you've got your protective device you need to allow for you've got your cable yeah now we just kind of need to be checking that it's not going to have any voltage drop issues as we go through the final part of the process and um <clears throat> understanding this at this point is helpful because it helps people work out not tonight won't be this way but i imagine other circumstances we do where voltage drop might become the limiting factor where actually you might have to start looking at bigger cables or shorter runs or thinking about different options when and you, when you say bolt drop what do you what do you mean by that what, what is that so the longer you go over this the distance of a cable the voltage will start to have a bit of leakage throughout the situ uh, throughout the system so if you've got a cable running over 100 meters for example it's not necessarily still going to have the 230 volt supply at the end of the installation where you're taking in whilst that's not always the biggest issue if you're running something like a motor circuit for example at the end of that point it could have relative consequences on the motor and the functioning and operation itself so people tend to ignore it but it is quite an important element if you want things to operate the way they are supposed to operate on your design. Oh, yeah. So it could affect the safe operation of equipment because all equipment obviously is designed to work within a certain voltage parameter, isn't it? So if you go under that voltage or over that voltage, it can have consequences. Um, it could avoid the manufacturer's warranty, I suppose, wouldn't it? Or affect how the equipment works, etc. Yeah, so, and could end up leading to injury for someone on site or a malfunction, couldn't it? So. So as, design, not... as designers, yeah. we have a set percentage to kind of work towards, don't we, based on on power and, and lighting. So there is a set figure that we're working to on on this one, Craig. So what we're looking at trying to keep within. So your your two percentages are three percent for lighting and then five percent for all other power circuits. So obviously we're doing a lighting circuit tonight, so we need to be looking at. 3% of our 230 volts is our range drop, which if people aren't sure how to do it, and there's a million ways to do percentages, I find the easiest way to be 230 times 0 0.03 gives me my 3%, which then works out to be 6.9 volts. So when we go through our voltage drop calculation, I must be getting less than 6.9 volts voltage drop. Later on, yeah, oh, sorry, Richard. In the on-site guide, is, is there anything that gives us a bit of information and maybe a formula and does anything there that reinforces what we just said? Yeah. Um, if you go to page 168 of the on-site guide, you have the voltage drop formula and then the paragraph underneath um, the formula itself actually starts to highlight that in the body of text and talks about the 3% and 5%. Yeah, perfect. Obviously, the... The on-site guide is generally aimed at like commercial domestic, so it doesn't talk about if you've got three phase in here, but we may in future episodes cover the difference of voltage drops on three phase installations and also um, look at the fact that voltage drop does include your sub mains and things on other installations. So it might be we've got a board feed in a garage and from there we're feeding lights and we have to allow for that whole journey within the calculation. But for tonight, we're just going to stick to our millivolts per amps per meter times our design current, times our length, and divided by a thousand. Now, the reason we divide by a thousand for anybody who's not aware is because we're talking about millivolts and we need to confirm it back to an actual voltage calculation. So the dividing by a thousand converts the millivolts back to volts. So we talked about a one mil cable. If people were to look at column eight on the voltage drop of their on-site guide, it would tell them that the figure they had to work from for the formula was 44 millivolts per amps per meter. So we go now, to the table F6 where we got our um, value of current for our one mil cable. Is that right? Yeah, that's the one. And then if we look at column eight, which is right on the end, volt drop, and it gives us this value that we need to put in this formula. 
So one mil, go across to column eight, millivolts per amp per meter. So for every meter of one millimeter squared cable, we're going to lose 44 millivolts. Is that right? That's the one. And so, as you then, sorry, go on, Richard. Come on, yeah, so 44 is the, the value that they're going to use to put in this uh, formula, correct? Yes. So 44 millivolts, and then we're going to times our design current, which I believe was 4.34 amps. Yes. Yeah. And then we're going to times that by the length, which I think I said was 20 meters at the start. Yeah. Yeah. And then divide that by the thousand, which gives us a voltage drop of 3.819 volts. So I've just, just those maths uh, for anyone following along, and that plays out as true. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I was just good. We're all doing it. None of us have it in our head. <laughs> But just trying to show on here for anybody who's not aware or not familiar with the calculator, this little fractions button, if it can be seen. Yep, I don't know about that. you guys, but that for me is a godsend of calculations with when you go top and bottom and brackets and everything else, just using that fractions button to lay it out on the calculator. Oh, uh, yes. It's my life a lot simpler. Yeah, it's so much better. So we now have to then confirm that obviously our 6.9 volts was our maximum so our 3.81 volts is less and therefore that would tell us that our one mil cable was sufficient for the installation that we've designed so i think at this point on this session we would be happy to say that we now have a circuit that we have designed I understand that people will then say there's ZS values and all the rest of it, but we are trying to do this in bite-sized sections so that it's not too much on the first night. So over the course of coming weeks, we will then look at thermal constraints, adiabatic, ZS calculations, and so on. But for this point and purpose, especially if you're at level two on your sort of on-site guide technology type exam or first year of apprenticeship that's probably as far as you're likely to be going on your design calculations to understand that you've developed a circuit that you could install and you have checked that it complies to the base level parameters being asked of you yeah absolutely what about if you've only got 1.5 mil squared on the van could we use 1.5 you can use it and obviously it will change the values that you have because the bigger the cable you go the the lower that's going to affect your voltage drop and other sort of factors but what you can't do is go the other way if the circuits told you that you need 1.5 you can't go and go i've only got one mil on the van and drop down and use that unless you are changing the layout or the design of your cable oh, yeah. bigger so, is always better but it has more cost attached it does yeah okay so, so if, we, if we didn't have a drum of one mil we, we could certainly one mil is that is is more than adequate for this circuit but one five would do it wouldn't it still I know we'd have more yeah. cost implication, but it can always go uh, the next size up. And sometimes you might need to if we don't. Let's say that we had a volt drop when we calculated it out. It was eight volts. Could we still have used that one mil cable? No. Once it starts to fail a part of the calculation, you need to then be looking at your other forms. And we, over future weeks, can show different ways and points where you can transpose a formula to tell you earlier on where you're likely to position yourself with things like volt drop and stuff because that will save you doing calculations seven times if you start to work some of those parameters earlier yeah okay makes sense makes sense to me yeah good that's a, it's a really good base point i think to start this little series on and you're right to reference the zs aspect craig and the adiabatic calculations because they do also play a part don't they when we're specifying our overcurrent protected devices and what we've got in the wider earthing system so there are some other factors but of a basic place to start that is a really good walkthrough that you two have just put on there that is properly properly good to anyone who's following i'm sure they will get massive value from that so when just as a, just as an outline i suppose because we're using that flat twin and cpc cable the cpc obviously would be smaller in some applications of that if you had a four mil for example you might only have a 1.5 mil cpc and that's where maybe the adiabatic calculation comes in to reinforce that that's going to be an adequate size and your, your ZS calculations that you can do as well. Yeah, and that has um, that has been done by a calculation of adiabatic. And what I think people, it helps us as sparks as well to have the conversation because you go, well, I've gone to do an EICR. There's 25 mil tailors coming into the house, but there's 6 mil um, main earth coming in. 
actually, I need to start coding this as wrong. But unless you've sat down and done the calculation, the person before you may have done that. And then I'm making numbers up. But in that scenario, it may well have calculated out. You could use a much smaller main protective earth coming into the um, building. And if you go and start coding it wrong because you don't know the calculation or you haven't checked it, you could start to make yourself look a little bit silly if there's somebody involved who is aware as to why it's of that situation. So just remembering these aren't just for the appendices, although that's where we're trying to kind of work with, but there's an application in the real world for these calculations as well. And the, the ZS calculation isn't as simple as um, ZE plus R1, R2, is it? I think there's a... They use a multiplier in that as well, don't they? Is it one one point two? I think I might be making that up. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it depends on temperature. It depends on your setting and what you're doing and what you're installing. So your one point two is generally a seventy degree thermal blast at eleven for the cable to come to that seventy degree operating temperature when it's working. If you've got ninety degree, you would have a different multiplier. If it's not, if it's a sixty degree or you know, the different values of the cables have different multipliers, but we could go down a, a whole set of rabbit holes about whether 90 degree cable should even exist because manufacturers don't set their equipment to that standard to allow you to calculate it to its full benefit or not. But that's probably for a different episode on a mm -hmm. a different night, I think, isn't it? But yeah, the, the calculations and the rating factors are all inside the on-site guide. Um, they do give you those values to help you understand the benefits of what you're doing as well. Um, so yeah. we can look at that as it comes up. Yeah, I think once, once you've got a step-by-step -step approach to it, it's the same steps, but you just have to consider different things, that's all. You know, you, you've got to start simple, which I'd like to think we've kind of done that tonight. And then you, you gradually have other considerations to think of. Next time, I'm sure Craig will chuck in that it's grouped with a, another couple of circuits and we've got to consider you know a high uh, ambient temperature or something and ultimately how do they affect the size of the cable or ultimately they affect the current carrying capacity of it because you know the hotter you get them the worse the current carrying capacity goes so in effect you end up then installing larger cables but if you can you try and avoid these situations don't group it with other cables keep it out of that area where it's a high ambient, but you might not be able to because it might be running through a boiler room or something where that is the only route through. So the basic steps are the basic steps and you just add in other variables and you know, in effect, it just gets more complex. But if you always go back to the steps on it, then it's fairly straightforward, I think. Yeah, I think it is a process and you learn your own process and you go down that way. I yeah. think um, people get stuck if it asks you the question slightly outside of your normal process that you've rehearsed like, a yeah. few times, but that's, as part of the journey, if there is a level where you want us to pitch us up, if there is something you want us to use as a situation, then do give it to us and we will give our opinion. We're not saying we're experts, we're not saying we're right. We are just three friends sharing our opinion about how we would apply it as electricians in the industry. Yeah. I think I think the next logical step on this would be to maybe look at something like a, a shower circuit running through a bit of thermal insulation <laughs> and put together... <laughs> through some trunking maybe down to a consumer unit alongside some other cables. That's yeah. the next logical step, I think. And then we can maybe work up to some longer circuits in a factory environment. And if anyone, as Craig said, has got any kind of things that he would like us to cover, we're happy to do that. We'll try and expand on it to include some of the correction factors yeah. and other bits and pieces along the way. The idea is that this is supporting you in your training and learning. So if there's bits you've missed out, in college while you've been going through training and, and COVID's been kicking about, you want to refresh on something, do reach out and let us know because we're more than happy to yeah. speak about a specific scenario. Otherwise, we're just going to make stuff up that might not be relevant to you at all. So point us in the right direction. Give us a bit of a steer on that. Yeah, well, you never know. You might have been asked by a relative or an auntie or something because you know what happens when you go into your apprenticeship or even when you qualified. Oh, you know, I couldn't see old Jimmy. He'll, he's his electrician. He'll come and do it here because there might have been to B and Q and bought themselves a, a new shower, as Mark said, or you know, there may be a, a job there for to install an EV charger or another piece of equipment in a factory. You just don't know. But it's the same process. You still need to go through the same steps to enable you to design the circuit in accordance with the regs and make sure that it's going to be safe at the end of the day. It's the same process. So yeah. 
It is, and it's commercially important as well, as Craig kind of leaned to at the start of this. You can now start specifying particular products when you're producing your quotation. You've got that scenario now for that particular the wattage of fitting, but you could use something that's less than that and know that the other factors are going to be you know, largely okay. And you've got that base point of design as well for if you do get the job, you go ahead and install it. You can reference back to that at the testing phase and see if the measurements you're obtaining kind of match up with what that's telling you it should be. And they can point you towards an issue in the installation where you might not have got a termination quite right or there's something not as it should be. Maybe your circuit ended up a lot longer and you need to revisit that design because yeah. the builder's extension and architect's drawings were wrong. It does happen. So you've got that data there to look back to if this is a commercial application outside of a simulated example for training. You know, Going through the design process is so important, however much you think it's rule of thumb and you've done it a thousand times before. Because once, as we'll see later on, when we're doing some more of these examples, a bit of insulation and grouping factors creep in, stuff starts to get messy. And it's important to stress that when we talk about a design process, there's nothing said, as far as I'm aware, that you must have written down every calculation that you've done with a supply and that bit of logic, isn't it? With a calculator in your hand as you go around and go, look, I know this is this and I know that is that. So put this together, put that together. There you go. That's what I need is that sort of installation. And we'll try and give hints and tips on sort of three phase and things as well when it comes in. Like if we're sat in a design meeting and the client turns around and says, what size breaker do I need for this circuit? That ability to be able to go, well, approximately this, or it's going to cost roughly this at that point in time, rather than sort of going, um, let me go away, come back to you next week. It just doesn't always give the best impression if you're competing with others for jobs and things as well. Yep. 100%. That's so true. Having a little bit of knowledge and being able to work stuff out is, is a great way to do it. I've also got Spencer Henry from Electrical OM who's coming on the podcast. I think we're coming on the 4th of July. He's going to record that. So that'll fit in nicely, I think, following on from other bits and pieces we'll have done up to that point where we can maybe introduce how software can help us out a little bit as well through the yeah. course of design. Because obviously we're doing all of this in a manual way through calculation and looking in the books, but there is also tools we can use out in industry that are going to help us with electrical design. So I think that's going to tie up quite nicely, actually. Yeah, I mean, I've never yeah. used any... Um, uh, I'm a bit old school. I've never used any design software, so I'll be interested to uh, have a little look at that. That'll be good. But I know there's some great some great um, software out there now that there's some really, really good stuff. Yeah, and I think Electrical OM for me, I, I use it commercially every day, um, as you guys know. And when you compare it to other design softwares out there, and I'm not sponsored, I'm not paid for them, I pay my license every year to renew it and use it of my own choice commercially. Um, it just does other stuff doesn't compare to it, in my opinion your likes of trimble or am tech as it used to be called like the the joy with electrical ems it's got quite a lot of electrical clerks and works and designers in there who are building it by electricians for electricians so it's user friendly it's quite often updated and you know freely updated you don't pay to renew anything and it has the regulations built in. So once you know you've built a compliant design on there, if you've put everything in properly the way you should, you've got a compliant installation that stands up in 95% of situations with more options than I can think of. I mean, I opened it today and got a big warning that there's a newer version. So I need to download that tonight to bring the it's next brilliant. set of information in. The newer version is amazing because it includes solar PV. That's what's I've downloaded. I've downloaded it already. So we've been using various bits of software in the solar space to try and do designs, and it's reasonable, but it's nothing like as detailed as the stuff OM puts together. This is your software that's packaged together by a wholesaler, for example, to help you spec a PV system. Where Electrical OM is really getting into the nitty gritty of electric circuit design and including solar on that is fantastic. And they do support us here at Apprentice One to One. I do pay for my own license, but big up to them. And I think it'll be nice because it does graphically show you what the circuits look like. We're talking about this and verbalizing it on the podcast. I realize people will be watching on YouTube, being able to see these circuits drawn out with the calculations put on them might be helpful. So we can do another scenario ourselves where or two, we'll run through it. And then we can also show that with OM. Is there anything else either of you two want to cover on this podcast before we draw it 
to a finish. Just to say to students, if if you want more information on this, reach out to Spencer or get your tutors to reach out to Spencer because when I was last in the college, he came and done a training day for all of our level three electrical students and spent about four hours, I think, taking them through electrical and they all had training licenses to do and they do give out college licenses and stuff as well for students to practice and develop and learn the skills. So if you're thinking, oh, I'd be interested in seeing what that does, reach out they will provide that and they will give information they will give support and it won't cost a penny as far as i'm aware and it may help you enhance your knowledge if it's an area you want to go into in the future reach out they do do that i'll drop a link in the description i know they give free licenses to training providers and the learners so if you want to sample that do get in touch and i can join those dots up for you i'm actually meeting spencer tomorrow i'm on the proteus tour again that you came to richard yeah, and spencer's fantastic. Spencer's coming along, so I shall remind him again that he's um, going to come and talk to us and give out some free licenses to training providers. Yeah, fabulous. One just thing I'd just mentioned just before we go, obviously we're talking about design, and don't forget that the design is important because ultimately when you fill out your certification for that installation or that job, there is an area on the certification for design. So design is important and it needs to be right at the end of the day because if the design isn't right, and the consequences of that is, you know, fire or death or something else. And it comes back to the, a bad design. At the end of the day, you're going to have to explain yourself in a court of law. That's, that's it, you know, it is that important. So just uh, one more thing to consider, really. Good point. Not, and not only that, it may impact your business hugely. We've just ordered a load of cable off of one of my designs, and it was a £5,000 bill of cable. If you've not done it and been lazy, I think your employer's not going to be very happy when that's all coming back out and it's got another set of cable going back in that's cost more. Yep. Such a good point again. So there is a lot of variables to this. That's why the design <laughs> process is super-duper important. Thank you both for going through that one with us. Tonight, I think there's going to be a lot of trainees and apprentices who will be really enjoying following along with this little series. We'll come back again in a week or two's time and revisit another scenario and run through it. In the meantime, if you've got any questions, reach out in the comments alongside this video or also get in touch with us on any of the social media platforms. Massive thanks to you again, Richard and Craig. I've really enjoyed it. Certainly looking forward to learning more myself, running through some design with you guys. And until the next time, we'll see you then. Cheers, everyone. See you. Bye-bye.